Um, and then there will be a scheduled break during this morning um, and speakers will do their best to keep to session timetable. OK, so I'll hand over to Andy now. OK, so I'm just going to start off by introducing the CIFA Climate Change Working Group so that you understand what it is we are and where we came from. And then I'm just going to give a little bit of a food for thought at the end of that with regards to net carbon zero. So the, the, the working group was set up in early 2020 after um, uh, the, the archaeologists number 108, which had a theme on climate and picked up sort of some of the, the shared comments from some responses from members that form part of the committee in relation to that. So it was thought a good idea that CIFA should set up a working party that would look at ways in which we can reduce the impact on the environment and respond to the climate crisis that, that is emerging and, and has been emerging for quite a while. So our, our, our aims were, we're gonna try and provide advice for CIFA and, and its members on how to help reduce carbon emissions. We wanted to include members in that. So everyone listening, we're hoping that this will encourage you to share your ideas and for and also just to promote the group amongst the rest of the sector. So that would really help us in achieving the overall aim, because the more we can communicate what we're trying to achieve, the better. We're also looking at ways in which we can sort of seek out expertise and feed feed that back into, into members to help them get use of, of, of other people from other sectors who are maybe more advanced than we are or other people within the sector who've been doing things successfully. And really, this is a matter of supporting the CIFA members in the long run to try and achieve this um, massive target of reducing our carbon emissions. So we there are some wider issues of advocacy and ethics, but we today we want to focus on what how our operations impact on the climate if we can do that and given that in 2050 we're we're expected to be achieving net zero which is so we need to be about halfway to that target in just under eight years now the current position is not necessarily in the sector but um, as a global measure across the country is, is that at the moment we've reduced maybe our emissions by somewhere between three and five gigatons and we need to be hitting sort of more than 20 so we're really at best only a quarter of the way there and yet there's eight years to achieve that other three quarters and the further you get there's some easy wins at the beginning but as you go forward it becomes harder and harder to reduce those emissions I mean, as an example, as individuals, we contribute something in the region of 9.5 tonnes, and we need to be get, getting that down to, to five. Obviously, we don't, we don't have all the answers as to how we're going to get there, but what we want to look at is good ideas as to steps forward. And I think that in, in understanding that, we, we need to realise that actually carbon emission reduction is just one step so net carbon zero means balancing emissions which is what we're trying to do by reducing them with removal and the thing that we're not looking at and haven't been thinking about because obviously reducing emissions is a challenge in itself is in the end for an in and businesses are charged with by 2050 being net zero it means that in 2050 we should have a mechanism for removing carbon as a business from the environment. I did a little exercise myself just quickly on, which was just taking a hobby of mine, which is beekeeping. I looked at that and I looked at my activities on that. And in a nutshell, my bees are about seven miles from where I live. I drive to them. I'm emitting car carbon emissions there. Um, I have to sterilize the jars. I have to buy jars. So um, glass jars have to be made. They have lids that have to be made. Um, so what things could I change? I thought that would reduce it. I could cycle. I mean, looking after nine colonies on a bicycle is pretty hard work. It would get me fit, but you know, that's going to reduce those vehicle carbon emissions. Um, or, uh, I could, I can, and, and I do reuse glass jars, but you know, there's a, there's regulatory issues there, which would need to be more relaxed if we, if that was to be expanded more. Um, but overall, I, 
just looking at the activities, I found it really difficult to get my emissions to zero. So I'm not going to just in, a, in that small single activity sort of hobby of mine, I'm not going to get my emissions to zero. And I thought, but what about carbon? <laughs> what about the removal then? Now, obviously that's an easy, uh, it turned out it was a bit of an easier win than I thought because, because bees are pollinators and increase and help increase the amount of vegetation actually in that case, by keeping the bees, I am contributing to removal of carbon from the atmosphere through plants. But I mean, I think the big question from that is, as a business where we're not actually naturally interacting with, with the, the growing environments around us and, the, and the, the, the organic ways in which carbon can be removed, how are we going to be removing carbon in 2050 from the atmosphere to create that net carbon zero? So that's a thought. I'll leave you with that and I'll pass over to Dan Phillips, who's going to, who's one of the members, or the founding members of the Climate Change Working Group. And he's going to present the C for Carbon Reduction Guide Table, which is a work in progress, but and he'll be looking for input for that. But I think it, at the moment, it, it's quite a good solid way, practical things that we can do to work towards this. So I'll pass over to Dan, thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, and good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen with you. Hopefully this will work. So you should be able to see now in front of you the CIFA Carbon Reduction Guide Table, uh, which I will talk about. I've only got 10 minutes, so it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind um, you know, uh, guide. But I think uh, Andy um, used a phrase that sort of is quite apt for archaeologists and that we don't have all the answers but we are constantly searching for answers in in our daily lives and and this has never been more true with 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 climate change um there are very few climate change experts within archaeology uh, and we as a result are having to like others having to grapple with this uh and and react uh um very quickly so so when we started this group, um, this was partially spurred on by our sister organisations who also work within the same spheres as archaeology. So groups like RIBA, RICS, RTPI, OHBC, all realising that this is a major issue and starting to look into it, form groups, produce guidance, certainly um, for, for their sectors. Um, as you may be aware, uh, RIBA have launched their uh, uh, 2030 challenge so that all architectural practices will be carbon neutral by 2030 having spoken to many archaeological uh, architectural practices they have no idea how they're going to achieve this in in eight years uh, but it it gave us a, a starting point um, within the group itself again there are some experts in climate change and but the vast majority and including myself i would i would say we're not um so so what we wanted to do was start off by providing some blue sky thinking and uh, to provide some help and assistance to archaeological contractors, whether it be a company that has a thousand staff or a company that has one staff. But really, this was a, a starting point. So we came up with, with an idea of producing a table we broke down the whole archaeological process in commercial archaeology from the beginning to the end, field work, office work, all the various aspects, archiving, et cetera, and divided them up into these um, seven, uh, seven domains. And then within, within, within each domain, we, we added four, four, concept, four, four, four individual categories uh, whereby we could uh, deal with a particular concept and then the justification for for that uh the reason behind uh tackling that concept um and in the level of engagement uh how, you know where where should this where should this be should this be at the individual level a company level or a, an organizational level and then we inter we we included some useful links and articles and some and some useful facts um we were very it, it dawned on us from the outset that this 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 list this reduction table was really as i said a starting point uh it was never meant to be a prescriptive uh, or definitive list but um but really a, a living document that 
will that's really in its infancy at this moment in time and as we go through the next 28 years uh, towards 2050 it will grow it will enhance as our skill levels improve then it will become uh, more finely tuned and and we took this carbon table and then we took it out to the wider uh, sector we took it out to all of the working groups within within CIFA and and beyond and we got input put from them to say look are these things valid should we be putting these things in here and more questions came out of the table than 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 answers really so one of the common things we we deal with is okay we're going to go to digital recording on sites and and actually most companies are now doing that but there we we grappled with the idea well hang on how do we measure this carbon and actually is the carbon of the tablet does that outweigh the paper usage etc um and then we started to move into realms of of ethical contracts should archaeology companies be engaging with unsustainable development we're seeing we're about to see new fracking sites coming open etc so and that's a minefield but the whole point of this was as a launch pad for some form of inspiration that people can come to this they can see it they can generate ideas large or small uh, and at the same time they can have input to us and and we want input not just from managers and of all of this but the individual archaeologists on sites how can they you know reduce their input so uh, you've probably all seen this or i hope you've all seen this table but we have just going over a couple of things here it's quite wordy but Let's take the first one under going digital, digitization of all future fieldwork recording to include all fieldwork recording sheets and all on-site illustrations. Well, as I've just mentioned, most companies are now digitally recording in some form or another. And as a county archaeologist, when I go and do my site visits, I now ask, are they recording digitally or on paper? And most of the time it's a hybrid, it's a hybrid mix. Um, we then provide a justification, as I said, so, uh, achieves a significant reduction in paper usage in fieldwork. But as I had said, we haven't worked out whether how that equates is the reduction in paper. We assume a reduction in paper is going to reduce carbon, but actually how does that equate to the use of the tablet and the digital storage in terms of carbon? And then we put down the level of engagement. So for instance, a sector level, CIFA, uh, Historic England, FAME, et cetera, universities, um, could they invest and develop an industry-wide open access digital recording system, uh, something uh, akin to the MOLA handbook, for, but for digital purposes? Um, uh, can they acknowledge and research the impact of archaeology as a practice on the environment and its carbon footprint, which they're already doing? Historically, they're doing amazing things in, in this area at the moment. Moving down then the, 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 the pyramid to an organisational level, can companies invest in appropriate cost-effective technologies? Can they provide um, necessary training? And then right way down to the individual uh, to be aware of their paper usage in the office and on site. Um, so there's small things everyone can do. And we move through the list. We have digital recording. Um, we then move on to site photography. Um, certainly uh, when I go and visit sites as an, uh, uh, monitoring sites now, I, I I can't remember the last time I saw a a company using 35 millimeter black and white film photography on sites. Um, and even though it's still in the guidance, but, you know, are we able to reduce that process? Because uh, the processing of film is, is carbon intensive. Um, are we able to go fully digital? And so we work our way through this list. Um, and what we are after now is that this is i think we've achieved something here uh i don't think we have got this list out to as many people as we should be getting it out to i'm still meeting people that have never seen this list and i think that's that's uh something we need to address um but the next step i think is now we we need people's involvement we need organizations companies individuals to come in to to look at what we've done to enhance it to add uh case studies so we can build this up but that is where we're at with the carbon reduction guide table thank you very much i'll stop sharing now 
Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, there's some, there's, so certainly if you've not looked at it, I would recommend that you do sort of dive in there and have a look and see for your various organisations what things there might be on there that you can do now and what things you can be pushing organisations to do for the future. Um, so I mentioned net zero in the in the introduction and we're going to have Dan Miles from Historic England present what um, Historic England's current project is to support our sector in, in moving towards this. So if I can pass over to Dan Miles. Hi, oh, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, okay. I'll just try and share my screen. Da, da, da. Can everyone see that? Get a... Yes, Dan, can you see that? Thanks, Dan, yeah. yeah, oh, lovely, thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna be introducing this project that we started in June and going through it and, and actually just picking up on what Dan uh, said then, a lot of this project is about awareness and about approaching, promoting awareness and looking at what areas people need support and what what we are able to work together and to provide that support so i think this will fit in really well with uh, with the, the the toolkit the the um the carbon table that dan was showing a, a minute ago and some of the other uh, work that the um the working group's doing the special interest groups doing so i will just start so uh, yeah i'm dan mars i'm the uh, i work in the sector resilience and skills team um and I am the project lead on our Sector the Net Zero project. So just a bit of context, um, Historic England as part of our um, funding agreement from DCMS, one of the priorities was to support or for, for ourselves to um, look at our becoming net zero and also to support the sector and heritage organizations, in particular small and medium sized heritage organizations to, to reach carbon net zero in line with the, uh, the government's uh, strategy. So this is really is a gallop through the project because it's only just started, but I just thought it'd be really useful to give a, an idea of what we're doing in the timeframes and all the different aspects. So we are, there are two phases. Uh, the first phase is the consultation phase, and this is from June up until uh, next March. Uh, and that's the main bit we're in at the moment. Um, and I'll go into more detail about that. But then the second phase is the support phase. And that is being looked at in terms of how we develop it. And a lot of that will be coming out of the results of the consultation. And the time frame for that is April 23 to March 25. So basically, it's a two years sort of a, a time frame for that, for the support. So part of the consultation, um, June onwards, I've been having loads of chats on the phone and Teams meetings with key stakeholders, including speaking to Alex and talking to the, the CIFA group, talking to IHBC and um, other professional and umbrella organisations um, and networks that exist, for example, the industrial heritage sector um, network or the Heritage Alliance, all these different groups that represent heritage organizations, getting a feel for everything and working with them because that's gonna be the key to being able to support organizations. Uh, we have a survey out mid-October. Uh, mid-October in my mind is about sort of the 23rd, 24th rather than the 15th at the moment, but it will be out in a couple of weeks and I will send out the link and I'll speak to Alex and the rest of the people to, to get the link out to as many um, CIFA members as possible. Um, I'll talk about the survey in a second. This will be followed up by roundtable discussions in November to December. And due to the nature of the project, this is gonna be really key, I think, in terms of sort of drilling down to some of the key issues. Having said that, loads of this work's already been identified by the group and it's fantastic to see it. And they've really, really moved on um, with some of their stuff. And then Jan to March is the analysis and recommendations, which then leads on to the second phase. So who is the consultation aimed at? I mean, if it was for just archaeology, 
I'll be well in my comfort zone. Be easy because I am an archaeologist. I'll be so happy. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, and it's much broader. And in fact, it is all heritage organisations or all small, medium, and we're now including micro heritage organisations because there's an awful lot of micro, micro sort of under 10 people who are working on that. It also would then pick up lots and lots of the volunteer led uh, heritage sites and activities that are being undertaken. So that's the focus. Um, at the COVID response right at the beginning, the government asked how many heritage organisations there are, or they thought there was about 250 in the country and they had to do a very quick calculation and we came back with there were about half, five and a half thousand. Again, that is a very rough estimate, but that's the sort of numbers we're looking at in terms of uh, organisations that may well require some support. So it's being split up in terms of the survey, very, very simply uh, in terms of managing and run uh, or support a heritage site. So these are the sort of the industrial heritage sites, the castles, forts, all these type of things. Really, this is to focus on the issues or the, the, the requirements for people to think about the buildings and what changes. Whereas, and then the other uh, section is those that provide heritage services. So contractors, the consultancies, professional associations. And again, this is probably more gonna be focused on operational uh, things that can be done. There's a bit of both, but we just wanted to split it up into those two main areas. So the, the, the consultation, there's three main things we wanna find out. Uh, the first thing is very simple, at what stage are organizations on their journey to reach net zero? So basically this is getting some baseline data. So of, as of October, November, 2022, X percentage are at this stage. So this is, you know, where are they? Have they started thinking about it? Uh, are they, have they actually got a, a, a policy? Have they got an action plan? Have they measured it? Are they getting their targets? All these sort of areas. The second question or the second area's question is what are the barriers or what are the issues that people are finding? I've just put these as, you know, to include we haven't done the, the survey, I don't know, but through consultation and talking to colleagues, my own colleagues and friends who work in the sector, you know, what, what are the issues? Confusion, where do I start? Where do I find information? It could be that sort of stuff. You know, why do I have to do it? You know, I'm only a small organisation. They've asked me to, for my targets, you know, <laughs> why I don't want to do it. Um, that's the sort of things we need to think about and how we can then, the third part is how we can actually support um uh um the the sector and again are we looking at training are we looking at case studies uh is there actually help with writing action plans is anyone good at writing an action plan can i you know can we have sort of drop-in surgeries where people actually come in with a you know how do i do this or which carbon calculator do i use things like that you know which is the what are what information can we trust is always a, an interesting one. If you Google stuff, there's so much out there. So actually what is relevant? And actually we need to think about what is not just relevant, but what is proportional to what we're actually trying to do. And I think um, Dan made it very clear or, and Andy earlier on about actually, you know, getting to net zero is very difficult. Um, and do we just want to be aspirational? Do we want to try as much as we can? And potentially for the next year or so, is it just about awareness and support for making things, making organisations more comfortable with what they need to think about rather than being a, a target driven world? Apart from the fact that I know that a lot of uh, organisations are being asked to sort of provide that sort of information and get that uh, by utilities and infrastructure projects because it's, it's all feeding down, it's dripping down through the chain. So, a lot of that and that sort of that that um, richness of information is we're really going to get down to it in the roundtable discussions. So I'm going to be organising discussions again across the sector, and I'm going to thinking very much about doing it topic uh, thematically per sector area. So, for example, having a, a discussion with the industrial heritage sites and talking about their issues and their their, their worries, 
And I know that's going to go off into tangents about where do they get fossil fuels for their steam engines, but that's something they need to consider and think about how can they, how are they going to deal with that as well as cost of living crisis, etc. But we will also be doing some um, with, with um, through hopefully through CIFA and the group and uh, with lots of people who will be able to come to it um, through uh, archaeologists. So looking at some of these things and building up that awareness. Um, this is the second to last slide. So a quick whiz through. April 23, we'll see the, the writing the delivery plan and it will be setting out support for uh, the sector. Um, until we know what we need to do, I can't tell you very much more about that one. But I think there's a lot of people out there who are at the beginning of the journey. And I think I, I certainly see this part of the work is something to help people at that sort of uh, moving on from awareness to actually understanding what they can do and then step helping them step through those those different stages and this is something that we'll be discussing with all the different stakeholders and and, and CIFA and that is it um, you can read our climate change strategy on the web uh, the survey is at coming soon url um, and please drop me a line if, if anyone would like to have a chat about the project. Um, it's the usual historic England address and it's daniel.miles. I think Dan might work, but Daniel's probably the safer one. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dan. If you could just drop your contact details into the chat, then people will be able to see that yeah. later, yeah? Will do, I'll do that now. And so obviously, so, so far we've, We've looked at ways in which different parts of the sector are trying to support each other in delivering this um, astronomical target that we've been set. So we're going to move on to what I think might be some some sort of mixing some real life examples with that. Um, so Andrea and Demetrios are going to present a paper on sustainability and cleaner construction. So they come from HS2. I'm not sure whether it is examples from HS2 but I'm sure they'll um, enlighten us in that respect. So Andrea and Dimitrios, if I can pass over to yourselves. Yeah, great. Thank you, Andy. Um, Alex, would it be possible? Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. And apologies for not having my video on. It's just that HS2, Firewall and Zoom doesn't really cooperate. So my name is Dimitrios, Dimitrios Economides, and I'm a sustainability manager at HS2. And together with my colleague Andrea Davidson, a quality manager, we will provide you with a summary of sustainability at HS2 with a focus on carbon and clean construction innovations. So if we move to the next slide, thank you. So as you know, HS2 is now being built. Uh, 170 miles of new high-speed line is already under construction between Crewe and London. And in total, the government is planning over 260 miles of new high-speed lines across the country. And HS2 is gonna be built on different phases. Each of these phases will become operational at different times as they are completed. So phase one is currently under construction between the West Midlands and London and will be the first part of the network to open. Phase 2A will extend the railway from the West Midlands to the railway town of Crewe, and early works are now underway. And phase 2B will complete the journey into Manchester, bringing UK's three largest urban areas closer together. So if we move to the next slide, you probably know that HS2 is a large and really complex project. However, it's more than a construction program. It's also uh, the largest archaeology program ever undertaken in the UK, with more than a thousand archaeologists and scientists who have re revealed over 10,000 years of history, providing a fascinating insight into the everyday lives of people and communities. And also in terms of the ecological and conservation works taking place. HS2 is probably the biggest environmental project in the UK. Uh, we have already planted around 850,000 trees and shrubs, and we are creating a network of woodlands, wetlands, and new habitats in what we call the Green Corridor, which is along the line of the route 
and in total it's going to be around 33 square kilometers. So HS2 is the biggest railway investment since the Victoria era and a project that will probably underpin the construction and engineering sector for the next 20 years. So if we go to the next slide, um, the main reasons why HS2 is needed is that it has been designed to address three key problems facing the, um, the nation, facing the UK. First, it has to do with delivering more capacity. Demand for rail travel in the UK has more than doubled in the last 20 years, and HS2 will add vital capacity to the existing rail network by taking long distance train off it. Secondly, it's about cutting carbon. HS2 will be the UK's zero carbon alternative for long distance travel, and it will reduce the need for car, lorry, or plane journeys. And it will play a vital role in delivering the aforementioned goal of UK becoming net zero carbon by 2050. And th thirdly, it's about better connectivity. HS2 is the most important economic regeneration project in decades, and it will act as a catalyst for growth and help to level up the country. If we can move to the next slide. Um, just to give you a brief update, as you can imagine, due to the scale of the project, we have quite a few challenges to, uh, to address. And how we're going to build HS2 is as important as um, how we're going to set out some strategic goals. And we have those seven strategic goals that they highlight the benefits that the new high-speed railway will bring to people and places throughout the UK. The UK. And one of those goals, which you see here, titled as sustainability and respect, it also sets a sustainability objective that states that HS2 will create an environmentally sustainable solution and be a good neighbor to local communities. So if we move to the next slide, Sorry, just the next one. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So our commitment to environmental sustainability flows from HS2 agreement with DFT, the Department for Transport, down to contractor requirements for the design, the construction, and finally the operation of the railway. And it forms what we call as the golden thread. At the highest level, HS2 is required to deliver infrastructure that meets the requirements defined in the legislative process and enshrined in the HS2 Act. But stemming from those strategic goals, the objectives and the benefits, we have our HS2 sustainability policy that describes our approach to sustainability across all three pillars. So environment, society and economy. And then we have our HS2 environmental policy, which focuses on the first of those pillars by setting, um, setting out five objectives for environmental sustainability. So green corridor, historic environment, community experience, climate change, and responsible production and consumption. And moving to the next slide, I will go into a bit more detail about those objectives. So as I said, we are committed to meet the strategic goals and deliver those objectives as defined in our environmental policy. Um, the first one is the Green Corridor, which includes our overall Green Corridor approach, biodiversity and ecology, and also ancient woodlands. And our commitment is to create a resilient Green Corridor for both nature and people, whilst also seeking to achieve biodiversity gains. Uh, the second is around climate change, looking into carbon emissions and adaptation and resilience with a commitment to minimize the carbon footprint of HS2 towards a goal of net zero carbon emissions, um, also to, beat a net, to build a network that is climate resilient for the long term and to deliver zero carbon journeys from day one of operation. The third policy objective 
is the overall community experience and covers um, air quality noise, flooding, and the different types of funds that we have in place with a commitment to where reasonably practicable minimize adverse impacts of HS2 construction and operation on people and the environment. Uh, moving on, I believe that most of you are aware with our historic environment objective, which looks into the built heritage, archaeology and historic landscape with a commitment to reduce harm to historic environment and deliver a program of heritage mitigation, including knowledge creation through investigation, reporting, engagement and archiving. The fifth and last environmental policy objective relates to responsible consumption and production. This is a purely construction focused objective that looks into circular economy principles, responsible sourcing of materials, and efficient use of sustainable resources. However, we have some additional environmental requirements not specific to a single objective. This is what we call the overarching environmental commitments and relate to the different types of sustainability assessments, namely BREAM and SQL, and any environmental incidents, how we report and how we manage those. If we can move to the next slide. Um, apart from the environmental policy or the sustainability policy and the associated objectives, which are linked to our strategic goal, we also have an overarching environmental sustainability vision to provide zero carbon travel for a cleaner, greener future and achieve net targets for biodiversity. To this end, we have uh, published our environmental sustainability vision in January 2022, which launched new ambitious targets aiming to cut carbon emissions and extend our plans for biodiversity gains across the route. The net zero carbon plan, which we also la launched together with our vision, sets out the steps that we will take to achieve the targets as we build and operate a sustainable high speed railway. And also, our targets for nature recovery include our intention to secure biodiversity gains for phase one and phase two, moving beyond our previous position for no net loss. And on phase 2B, we will go even further and seek to achieve a 10% net gain in biodiversity as we de develop and build HS2 all the way to Manchester. If we can move to the next one. Thank you. So in order to communicate our progress, we're using several you know, different means from specific reports related to a particular topic to direct reporting to DFT or through the publication of the HS2 corporate plan. However, our main public reporting medium is the Environmental Sustainability Progress Report, together with the associated data appendix, which tries to deliver a balanced review of how HS2 is affecting the environment, how we are reducing our impact, and also to examine our progress in setting and meeting the environmental controls. It provides a detailed update of our performance on all the aforementioned environmental policy objectives. So we published our first report back in January 2022 and our second report covering uh, 21 to 22 will be released later this year. And now we'll be handing over to my colleague Andrea, who will be talking you uh, through the carbon management at HS2 and our cleaner construction innovations. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Demetrius. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, just to quickly check, because Zoom and I seem not to be friends. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks. Andrew. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. And again, sorry, you can't see us. I think Emily's managed to figure out how to get her camera on. Uh, but we'll rest of us will have to work on that but um it wouldn't be a, a hybrid meeting without um, some technical <laughs> difficulties um but so i'm andrea davidson um as demetria said I'm, I'm the air quality manager at hs2 and alex if you wouldn't mind just flipping to the next slide i'll try to sort of rush through them um, a little bit so we can have a bit of a discussion at the end 
But I work really closely with our carbon team, especially on, I mean, one of our key work streams, which is linked to diesel free construction sites, which I think is going to be something key that we can discuss uh, sort of between different industries. But Demetrius sort of mentioned already, but transport is the UK's biggest carbon emitter and for us to tackle climate change um, and supporting sort of economy and population. We've got to have zero carbon forms of transport going forward into the future. But that's where, I mean, yes, HS2 is going to be key in delivering that. But in terms of how we build today and what we do on the ground today is as important. And specifically in the construction industry, it's another one of the top polluters across the UK. And that's why it's sort of one of the key focuses I'm going to talk to about today. And I really see... I mean, yourselves as archaeologists is playing an absolute key role and I won't steal any of Emily's thunder she, she's coming after us to talk a bit more about this but you're usually first on site and the culture that you set on the ground sort of translates to the rest of that construction program and I mean from an HS2 perspective a lot of the work started by the archaeology teams is what we call cleaner construction now across all of our main work civil contracts so it's, it's been really exciting place to be to really set the tone for what's coming next. And if we just jump to sort of the next slide is so obviously we've got lots of work in terms of cutting carbon emissions, in terms of sort of what's happening. We do have processes, systems and tools all in place. And um, we've set some really key ambitions in our net zero carbon action plan, which was published earlier this year. And I see Emily's been fantastic at popping all the links in. So no doubt that link will appear next in the chat. But that includes, I mean, some key targets and one of them being net zero carbon construction from 2035. And I mean, from some of the presentations that you've done earlier, you're doing the same thing, you're setting some key goals within the archaeology space. And without action, though, none of these goals will ever be realized. So it's really key in terms of where we set those actions out that we can actually achieve what the goals we're trying to get to. Um, I'm not going to read through all the blocks on the screen, they're all there for you, but essentially what we're trying to do is build a consistent zero carbon culture, you know, raising awareness, making sure people understand building capability, carbon literacy, sort of really investing in innovation and then working across the industry to share those lessons learned. Um, and honestly, based on the plans I've heard earlier, it sounds like we're quite aligned from that space as well, but probably a really good opportunity to collaborate a little bit more in terms of you know, making sure we're aligned as well. So if we just jump on the next slide. I've already said our net zero carbon plan. Specifically um, in my world, we've got two key ambitions. First one being that we wanted to deliver our first diesel free construction site by 2022, which we delivered in May this year. Our SCS joint venture down in London delivered it at the Canterbury Road ventilation shaft. It is quite a small site where they're building a ventilation shaft for emergency access during operation. Very constrained site as well. It's sort of got residents on one side, a school on the other, and a railway on the third. But what the site did is really prioritize getting mains power connection to the site. And then they were able to deploy a range of electric equipment from some small diggers to pumps, compressors. Um, they had one of our 160 tonner fully electric crawler cranes on site. Um, and then where there was no suitable electric or other alternative, they were using biofuels. And then our second big commitment is around diesel free construction sites by 2029. And um, I mean, it sounds great, but that's only six years and, and two months away. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in the space in order to achieve it. And that's sort of what I'm going to focus on a bit now in terms of what we're actually doing on the ground. Um, so we just jump to the next one. There's some pretty pictures coming, which is good. Sort of mentioned earlier, you know, how we build as important. Um, and again, it probably linked to a lot of the work that your teams do out on sites. And we've got a real opportunity to start to do things differently. And unfortunately, and fortunately, I suppose, the price of diesel has absolutely accelerated opportunities for alternatives in this space and it, we really can on I mean, construction sites especially sort of this size across the route and this length of period we can really have that lasting legacy that we want to see um, I mean there is great progress happening in terms of trying to meet it but there's also challenges because not one construction site is the same I'm sure you all find it as well 
not one site is going to be the same, uh, probably a little bit even more so for yourselves. I think the first speaker said uh, you're constantly searching for things in your day jobs and searching for answers. And um, I mean, it's key, it's in the diesel space, there's definitely no sort of silver bullet, one size fits all. Which is why, I mean, on this program, we have a really fantastic innovation team. And what we do is work across industry partners, academia, innovators, to really trial and demonstrate and to just prove out different solutions. Because unfortunately in this space, there is a, a lot of glossy pamphlets that um, claim to solve the world. So it's really about you know, understanding what the real opportunities are and really focusing around efficiencies. How do we use what we have now most efficiently? So we just jumped to the, it's a second last line, I promise. Um, and I, I did promise some pictures. So that's, that's what we've got here. But essentially, just to give you a flavor for some of the different technologies that we're trialing sort of in the three key categories of, of welfare and accommodation, power generation and plant and machinery, which again, is quite key to what all of you do on sites as well. Starting with welfare, I mean, welfare cabins are usually located on the edge of our sites. It's usually closest to surrounding receptors and probably one of the first biggest nuisances that surrounding communities face. Um, generally, they're diesel powered, so you've got the hum in the background. And not only does it obviously increase pollution, but can be quite a nuisance from a noise perspective. So what we've, we did and are doing is, is using, and we did trial hydrogen fuel cell or clean air gas engines. Both are hybrid units. So that's sort of the first and second picture there. Uh, they've got solar panels across the top, works off solar energy and as a backup power source, they either have a hydrogen fuel cell or a, a gas engine, much quieter and significantly less polluting. Um, tower lights as well, hydrogen fuel cell are widely used across the industry now. The only byproduct from a hydrogen fuel cell is deionized water, which is drinkable. Um, moving into sort of the power generation, we've, we've also had hydrogen fuel cell generators on our site. So we replaced generators with two 250 kVA generators, so really large container size generators to power a desanding plant. Worked absolutely fantastically, but some challenges around access to green hydrogen, getting the hydrogen onto site as well. Um, we've also done a lot of work, I mean, with batteries, battery storage. As you can see there, that's a sort of solar pod. And then sort of top right hand corner is a punched flybridge unit, which is a flywheel technology, which essentially stores energy to release later on. So you can deploy a much smaller generator to site. And then sort of finally is plant and machinery. Yes, smaller electric machinery is widely available, provided we're not um, charging it around the back on a diesel generator so it would defeat the object. Um, but the smaller ones definitely market ready available. The larger size, I mean, I mentioned crawler cranes already. We've had three fully electric, really large crawler cranes. And most recently, we've had an electric drilling rig. The cranes work off batteries and can be plugged into mains, and the rig needs to be plugged into a mains power source or via an umbilical cord system. But it, plant and machinery is an exciting space with lots happening. Um, JCB, if you haven't seen already, announced sort of their hydrogen plants. So they've got a telehander and excavator. Um, I have seen them and in, in reality they do exist, um, just haven't been out on a, on a live construction site yet. They're doing all the testing in their various quarries. Um, and then just on the last slide, just to finish off, I mean, that's where we are now. There's obviously still a lot of work to do. We're working closely with the Construction Leadership Council on the industry-wide diesel-free route map. And again, where some of the goals are, where some of the gaps are and what actions we need to take. And the plan is to publish the different findings of case studies across the industry that everybody across the industry can use, that we're not just repeating trials, but actually making strides in the direction we need to go. So I'd be yeah, really interesting in hearing some of the challenges and opportunities that you have within archeology. span And I'm hoping that we can maybe work a little bit more collaboratively together to unblock some of them. And I know I've gone one minute over, I'm terribly no, sorry. That's fine, Andrea, <laughs> that's fine. Um, no, thank you very much, Andrea and Demetrios. That's really, really interesting. And I can see there's some lively chat building up in the background. Our plan was to take questions at right at the end of the whole session. I mean, on the actual program, it says questions in the middle between 11.05 and 11.15 as well. Although that, if you want a break, that was planned as the break. We could perhaps have some informal chat whilst people are having a break at that point. Um, but moving on, as you said, Emily's going to pick up on some of the detail relating on HS2 to the historic environment, I think. So if I pass over to Emily for now, 
Um, Emily's there. Yeah. Hi, Emily, you're uh, muted. Yeah. Oh, you're not yeah. muted now. Okay. Okay, good. You can hear me. That's good. Okay, and Alex is just doing my slides. Um, so, hi. Um, thanks to Andrea and Dimitrios as well. Um, really great guys. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm Emily Plunkett. I'm Historic Environment Specialist for HS2. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about heritage, carbon reduction, climate change and sustainability. Um, but first, uh, I'll probably just explore a little bit about why I'm here and what my team does. So next slide, please. Uh, as a heritage professional, obviously, I have a responsibility to consider the sustainability of our heritage for this and future generations. Um, I think what our work often does not do is lead us naturally to the area of sustainability, but I think we are closely linked to it. And as you see, lots of people are very interested and in doing lots of great work in it. And I think we should be thinking this way a lot more, um, as obviously everybody else on this call does as well. Um, the aims of HS2 um, also require me to think about sustainability as part of my work, as does the HS2 environmental policy, which you can see here. And these five principles uh, face further responsibility on me to reduce harm to the historic environment, but also to make sure I'm minimising the carbon footprint of HS2 um, and to ensure that my work links back to the sustainability vision and the net zero action plan. Um, the role of the historic environment team in HS2 is an informed client role. And as such, our ability to actually enact or really force change is reasonably limited. Um, most of our HS2 works are delivered by the supply chain, you guys. Um, and it's therefore you who have the power to enact this change. Um, you are, as uh, I think Neil Redfern would say, change agents. However, um, we do have influence as a client and to facilitate and contribute to the work of others, both inside and outside um, HS2 through building connections and through undertaking other activities. So in response to these requirements and our role on the project, I set out to see what I could find out about heritage within HS2 in relation to carbon reduction, climate change and sustainability. I did this over 2021 and 2022, and I captured thinking about what opportunities we could explore as a team and the areas we could potentially uh, influence or assist the work of others. And I then began exploring these opportunities, which led to seeking out networks or individuals already moving forward in these areas. And I have had chats with people on the call and um, I'll cover this, um, what this entailed and some of my initial findings at the end after I've shared some case studies and useful resources. Next slide, please. Uh, but now I also wanted to highlight another reason why I'm here. Um, so on phase 2B, which is the area of HS2 that I mostly operate within, um, we've adopted what we call the collective endeavour, um, which is our concept to bring all the teams and organisations delivering works on phase 2B together into one team, as it says here. Um, the aim of this is to improve ways of working with a particular focus on collaboration and safety. Um, and I wanted to highlight this in relation to collaboration and also maximising opportunities or responding to lessons learned. As I think these relate strongly to how we can address carbon reduction, climate change and sustainability as an industry. Um, in relation to opportunities, I'm obviously thinking mainly about spotting those opportunities. And ensuring that we explore them where possible, even if that exploration leads to a dead end, you know, at least then we know and we've tried. Um, but mostly I wanted to say I'm here because I think that we as an industry need to consider um, our response to climate change, carbon reduction and sustainability as our collective endeavour. So next slide, please. And I'm going to move on to some case studies from the project. Next slide again, I think. Please. <laughs> um, so this is Coles Hill Farmhouse in North Warwickshire. It was demolished as part of the works on phase one. Um, HS2 construction, demolition and excavation waste strategy requires those working on the project to uh, recover fixtures, fittings and materials from listed and historic buildings. It also re requires our contractors to divert material from landfill as much as possible. Therefore, as part of our demolition plan, we agreed with the local authority, we plan to reclaim and find a reuse for the materials from the farmhouse. The works were conducted with this recovery aim in mind. Now, obviously, not everything on a property of this age um, can be recovered, um, but we did recover 14,800 bricks, 16,500 roof tiles, 25 tonnes of timber, three tonnes of sandstone. Both we and the recipients of the materials were really pleased with this result. Um, we then passed some of these volumes through one of our carbon calculators and found that from the reuse of the brick alone, we've achieved a carbon benefit of approximately 6.6 .6 tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions, um, which is a pleasing outcome. Next slide, please. Now, our works are 
are very different from what we refer to as main civils. Um, but on HS2, we have the same contractual requirements to reduce emissions from vehicles, plant and machinery, whether you're doing ground investigations, archaeological works or pouring concrete. As a project, we've set industry leading emissions requirements and encourage all of our contractors to go beyond this wherever possible by using electric and hybrid alternatives to reduce the emissions. Reducing emissions further is even more important during our archaeological works from an operative health and safety perspective. We often have a large amount of people working in confined spaces or in tents. Now, St Mary's field excavations are a good example of this. The use of hybrid plant on, and EVs on this site also deliver the dual benefit of reducing the emissions and contributing to the HS2 carbon reduction targets. I think this is an important lesson to learn because while we may do something for a health and safety reason or cost reason or due to site constraints, we need to keep our eyes peeled for those dual carbon benefits and make sure we're recognising them, learning from those for the next project. Um, I think, and as Andrea picked up on, being on site relatively early in the project, we have the opportunity to raise and then set that bar for the contractors that follow us. Next slide, please. At HS2, we also think about the sustainability of the data we collect and we produce. Um, Archaeology is all about data. As you can expect, we've got a massive volume of data expected from just the phase one, over 15 terabytes, according to our colleagues at ADS. And we've been working with the ADS to overcome some of the challenges presented by such a massive volume of data to develop smarter ways of working and ensure the systems and capacity are in place to effectively manage that data. And we support and facilitate their work to take those lessons learned from challenging data and feed them back to our supply chain and also the wider industry. And we hope that the excellent work of ADS will result in the right first time approach to data, which improves the sustainability of both the data the systems and the organisations which need to handle it. And through their work, that the project leaves a legacy of digital skills gain um, within our industry. Um, in addition to our work with ADS, we have our technical standards, our HS2 technical standards, which govern how our data is delivered and provide a consistency approach for GIS data, report formats, figures, and help us achieve our desired end state for future access to the archives as one of our legacy items. Uh, we aim to continue working closely with the ADS to ensure that the data we're collecting is working towards the FAIR principles and that we leave a legacy of a sustainable, accessible data, which can then generate meaningful knowledge. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to have a look at some of the resources which HS2 is involved in or I found in my work, which I thought might be of interest. So next slide, please. And I know some of you on this call are probably already exploring this or have even passed that through the training for the Carbon Literacy Project. But I wanted to let everybody know this is an organisation which offers training and support to help companies improve the carbon literacy of their staff as they walk, work towards net zero future. Um, HS2 support and collaborate with the CLP and many of the staff, including myself and the rest of the historic environment team, um, have undertaken the training and are now carbon literate. Um, so what does carbon literate even mean? Um, so it means we have a grasp of the causes of climate change, the language used around carbon reduction and climate change, and understand what we could be doing to help reduce our personal corporate carbon footprints. It basically provides us with a foundation for all of our work towards the larger goals. Um, it doesn't make us experts, but it does give us a foundation. Um, I mean, I can only urge you to seek this out for yourselves um, and for your staff. It's a great place to start your journey towards reducing your company carbon footprint or continue it if you've already started that journey. If you're part of the HS2 supply chain, and we can also offer you assistance with this in the form of HS2 prepared training materials, which are approved by the CLP. We hope this will encourage folks to seek out the full training for themselves or allow you to develop your own version of that training to roll out to your staff. Of course, you can always reach out to us for our experiences or support. I'll like down pop my um, contact details in the chat after this. I just wanted to highlight that uh, Carbon Literacy Action Day is on the 7th of November. So another good opportunity to either start or boost your carbon work if, uh, if you need a little bit of a push. So next slide, please. Uh, another great resource, uh, Supply Chain Sustainability School. HS2 are a supporter a supporting partner of the school and um, my colleagues in the sustainability team exactly like Dimitrios in fact Dimitrios himself uh, work closely with them to develop training materials and training pathways to assist our supply chain um, why is this good for you well, it's free 
and there's loads of resources to make use of in your carbon related or just your general CPD life. Um, the school also has a carbon calculator, which I'm told is free, and I thought that might be of use to some of you looking to understand your carbon detail in more detail, uh, more, uh, your carbon footprint in more detail even, and um, maybe for your corporate plans or because your clients are requesting that information. Next slide please. Uh, now, this is something that HSC is not involved with, to my knowledge, um, but it came to me a few weeks ago as an IEMA member, and I thought it'd be really useful to highlight to those who are developing or looking to take their carbon sustainability plans to the next level. Um, essentially, it's a workbook and toolkit which IEMA have developed to assist organisations in assessing and then developing actions against their current capability. Dan, Dan Mann spoke earlier about action plans and how we do those. Um, so it's about developing actions against their current capability, corporate maturity, or the hotspot areas to the sustainability. Present, this isn't geared towards archaeology or archaeological works, but I think it's really an interesting framework which we could develop on to fit our needs. Um, next slide, please. And again, please. So now a bit about what I've been doing and how I came to the resources that we just covered. And I want to start by saying that, like many of you, I'm, I'm also at the start of this journey. Um, and I started by reaching out to our partner organisations, such as Historic England, FAME, the Environment Agency and CIFA to see what they were doing, start building connections and see how I could do to help others. Um, I've also been reaching out to some of the contractors based on articles they've published or conference sessions I've attended. And uh, I have to say, uh, all the conversations I've had so far have been really enjoyable, really fruitful exchanges of information and the enthusiasm and positivity I've seen is really impressive. Um, but what's clear is that we are all at the beginning of the journey and we need to find our way and keep talking to each other to find those paths or the path through. Um, I've also been working with one of our HS2 environment graduates to understand the, uh, to undertake a literature review um, of all the historic environment documentation relating to climate change, carbon reduction, and sustainability. So this is a step I took as it's clear that there's a lot of work going on, um, but it may be a little bit disparate. I didn't have a full vision of it. And so I wanted to bring it all together to get a full picture of where the industry was and what initiatives people were developing before we took any steps forward. Next slide, please. What have I found on my journey? Um, what I found, and you'll see this reflected in the carbon, the CIFA carbon reduction matrix pretty closely. And you know, again, there's starting to get a lot of rep repetition in the session already from the various presenters, um, is that what you can see on the screen are some of our main opportunity areas as an industry. So information provision and exchange, including storytelling and the facilitation of the narratives of others through sharing our skills. Data management in terms of data collection and digital archives for sustainability and longevity is a really big one. I'm sure the ADS will tell you that. Collaboration, um, you know, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Again, I think this issue transcends commercial interest and we're going to make sure that if we want to make sure that our industry is sustainable moving forward, um, we have to collaborate and share. Um, Fuel and plant, Andrea's touched on, so I won't cover it again here. But investigation with purpose is obviously key for us at HS2. Um, we've developed the herds approach, which ensures that we're thinking about the purpose of our investigation and that we're not causing impacts on the environment without a good reason. And if you're not familiar with herds, I can send you more information. We'll do my best to answer any questions you might have in the discussion slot. Uh, next slide, please. What would I personally like to see at the end of this journey? Well, um, I'd love to see a supply chain which we've helped to equip with the skills they need to move forward in a more sustainable way, including leaving a legacy of improved skills for future projects, um, which has embraced and understands the investigation with purpose approach. And that we've been successful in helping our stakeholders understand the sustainability angle of that approach and why that matters. Um, I'd like to see that they've adopted an innovative, collaborative and sustainable approach to the HS2 works. And um, I think it's really important to remember that Innovation doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be digital. You know, small things can make a difference. Like, you know, if you collect rainwater for washing your boots rather than using your drinking water. And as a project, I really hope that we will have fed into the development of guidance and support for the supply chain to help them reach these goals through collaboration with the ADS, CIFA, FAME and through HERDS. And that we've all been a part of setting, adopting and testing new standards. Um, I'd be proud to say that we've understood and shared our lessons learned and thus developed our practice as an industry um, on sustainability, as well as our understanding. Um, and obviously that we're ready for the next project, that we can push the bar further than we already have. Uh, next slide, please. 
the inevitable next step slide. Uh, next, I want to listen to you and understand where I can best assist you in your works and your journeys to make sure we're sharing lessons learned from the project, either as HS2 or in collaboration with those who deliver our works, uh, to continue to facilitate information exchange and build networks, which I know, I know we need to succeed in reducing our carbon, in facing climate change, ensuring a sustainable future both for our industry and for the heritage we protect. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, that's it. Massive thanks to Alex, to Sifa, to Dan and the others who let me have this opportunity. Um, I look forward to what comes next and welcome your questions. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Emily. That's great. I mean, some, I've got some interesting points to raise from, from that and the other talks. Now, a slight contradiction between my agenda and the one that's published is that we have strictly if we're going to have a break it's between it's up till 11 15 and take it people might appreciate a break it's a bit difficult for me to run a poll though because i haven't got one set up so if we could break and reconvene at 11 15 and we'll run a global discussion session from 11 45 onwards so um, I'll let you do what you need to to break, grab a cup of tea, whatever. Intuitive. Okay, hopefully everybody can now see that. Yeah, that's fine, Caroline. We can see it. Perfect. That's great because I can't see you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, as Andy said, um, I'm Caroline Rayner. I'm CJ Project Manager for Costane. So I work for Costain, a tier one contractor. I do have an archaeological background, but my role is now to lead uh, construction projects from design and inception through to completion and delivery. So I look after not only the archaeology, but everything else that goes into delivering large scale construction and engineering projects. I'm going to talk today a little bit about material culture, um, but not necessarily in the traditional sense that archaeologists might think about material culture. So it's a bit of a play on words and more thinking about the management and mitigation of materials during the delivery of archaeological projects. Um, so hopefully pulling on some of those golden threads that are running for this conversation and helping to uh, focus in on some very specific things that we can do. So why are we talking about materials, resources, energy and carbon? Well, basically, we are all very actively now responding to an ever changing world and that change is getting faster and faster and the implications for those changes are uh, slowly becoming more apparent and the impacts are becoming greater on our environment. So we are all responding to a changing environment and managing carbon and the way we manage materials and deliver our projects is becoming increasingly a focal point for everything we do from the tender process right the way through to the completion of the job and how we evidence that. Thinking about the route to net zero, um, we've started talking about this earlier on. I think Dan touched on it and um, the team from HS2 as well, but we are all starting a, a journey, arguably possibly too late, um, but we are making that journey now. And one of the questions for all the archeological contractors um, and the people who provide support to those contractors is, do you have a roadmap to net zero or a starting point for creating one? Obviously it's not too late to start thinking about creating one and aligning that with things like the UN sustainable goals and also what you see in the wider workplace with your clients and, and other uh, key relationships. Understanding the measure of carbon footprint for your project and your business, really challenging, really difficult. There's a lot of different ways of doing this. There's not a lot of standardization currently and it is something that's been talked about. Um, at the University of Cambridge, we're looking at it. It's been looked at at the ICE and um, obviously Historic England and CIFA are looking at it as well. So lots of people taking different approaches. Thinking about mentioning this in the future in your PQQ and tender stage when bidding for work. So all the archaeological project managers on the call, are you mentioning the presence of this and, and how you define your goals and objectives? It's not currently a mandated requirement for all contracts, but it is likely to become one. And really, it's about thinking how prepared you are, how prepared are we all, and understanding what our clients expect. And again, that will come back to some of the things that I touched on in previous talks with CIFA, which is speaking a common language and understanding shared values and shared goals to get where we all want to be as part of this process. I'm not here to plug Costain, so I'm going to fly through this. But the key thing you need to note is that much like the majority of the other tier one contractors, we expect to be operating 
at zero carbon, net zero carbon by 2035 uh, against our 2020 baseline. And we expect that all our operations, including our supply chain, are doing the same as well. So there's a real commercial driver here as well for people, as well as the environmental imperative, which is you may find yourself not being invited to tender if you're unable to evidence or meet these requirements because people's expectations are changing and what they want to see in those documents is changing. So before I start talking about uh, materials on site, I just want to draw attention to a few resources and a few specifications that the construction industry worked to. So PAS 2080, PAS is a publicly available specification, um, and this one specifically focuses on the global standard for carbon management and infrastructure. So this is kind of one of the baseline documents. So over and above something like something that Tideway or HS2 might produce, this sits off to one side and is a, a global standard, um, something that we refer to when we're looking at how we design our projects. It asks you to think about uh, cl carbon management with regard to change, consistency of data. It also looks at you thinking at it through the entire supply chain and promoting whole life costs. And that's not just financial costs, that's carbon costs as well. And it shows you how to do that across the entire uh, project life cycle as well, which is incredibly important because there's no good thinking about it at the beginning and then forgetting about it by the end and not having any way to measure or sum up what you've achieved and how you've done this. Um, I think Emily touched on the supply chain uh, school. I would strongly advise everyone to go and look at this. We use it a huge amount in construction. It's got some great information, great free training. It's very engaging um, and they have some really, really talented people working for them. So engaging with that free resource is uh, a great thing to do. So archaeology and site one materials, what are site one materials? Well, basically they are any useful natural or man-made product or material which is encountered on site. So when we take possession of a construction site, there'll be stuff already there. It might be things above ground like buildings or fencing or utilities assets. And there will be things buried below ground. And often it's the things buried below ground that have the, the greatest risk, but also the greatest value. And archaeological contractors are generally the people who know best what is buried below ground, which is why you are so important in the consideration of Site 1 materials as an entity and as part of the supply chain. Importantly, all of these Site 1 materials contain embodied carbon. Um, unlikely sources of archaeological based Site 1 materials include what you can see to the side, so 6A and 6F2, brick and stone from buried structures and foundations, cobble sets or surfaces, I know you often have to battle your way around concrete from later intrusive piling from the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, um, but that is also a site one material. And site one materials can also be deposits which do contain archaeology as well, so things like clay, sands and gravels, which we might want to incorporate into the design on site um, for production of roads or embankments, etc. Um, the important thing, um, and there is a takeaway slide at the end of this, is that Correct segregation of these materials saves time, money and carbon, um, with carbon taking primacy in this instance, and it reduces the amount of materials which construction contractors and clients have to import for carrying out other activities. And these materials might be used in a temporary way and then recycled and reused for a second, third, fourth or fifth time, or they might form part of our permanent work. So the actual permanent design of what we leave behind on site long after the archaeological team have finished their works. Um, But we can't just generate waste material um, or reuse material without following certain protocols. So one of the uh, guidance pieces that we have to follow is a document put out by the Environment Agency called the RAP Protocol, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, if you're not familiar with this, again, if you're an archaeological project manager or a site manager, it would be a really good thing to go away and have a quick look at this to understand actually how you are contributing to this process but basically grubbed out foundations or structures which were deemed to be archaeology at the point of discovery and then have been recorded um, and part of the mitigation process, then become part of a waste process that has to be managed by the people who come along behind, so the contractor, be they tier one, two, three or whatever. And segregation by archaeological contractors with support from the clients is key. Um, so this tells you the standards to which this material has to be managed processed and reused and there's a huge swathe of standards that we have to meet to allow this to be appropriately used measured and reincorporated into construction site activities so that it's safe for use 
heritage salvage and reuse of materials. We've already touched on this with the HS2 team as well. And this is actually a photograph of a building that was demolished as part of HS2 enabling works in Houston. Um, but obviously a lot of heritage structures on site contain huge amounts of embodied carbon uh, and simply smashing them down isn't the way we do things anymore. Um, and we don't want to be the last pointless sustainability supply chain where things are just sent off site, site and go straight um, to a sort of a landfill or a waste dump site. We're not allowed to do that. We have to divert at least 97% of our generated waste or materials which could be perceived as waste and find an alternate use for them. And using heritage salvage and building materials is a really important part of that. Um, so if you are working, recording a heritage structure and you're on site at the time of demolition as an archeological contractor, helping to record any features which might be identified as part of that process, um, if you're able to engage with the contractor and speak to them about who their salvo registered salvage contractor is the project, or if you already have direct relationships with your own, then that's great um, because you're then able to inform the demolition contractor, inform the tier one contractor about potential materials which could be sustainably salvaged, packaged and reused. And obviously the packaging piece is really key as well because they have to be fit for purpose when they arrive at the other end to have any meaningful value going back into the supply chain. Um, Spoilerizings are also a huge part of archaeological works. Um, we generate a huge amount of excavated material as part of any archaeological project and thinking very early on, <clears throat> having really direct, honest, clear discussions with your tier one, tier two or tier three contractor about how you're going to be managing this <clears throat> or even thinking within your own team about how you're going to be managing it if you're doing it in advance of works for a client. Um, thinking about the likely volume of spoilerizings, the bulking factors, so how much it's going to puff out once it's got some air in it, and how materials will be stored and managed on site can all be really important because the more you move materials around, the more that material deteriorates. Um, so the less quality it is and the less likely you are to be able to reuse it in either a temporary or permanent works area on site. And also you need machines to do this and you need people to do this. It's time, it's labor, it's carbon, because most of those machines on a large number of smaller sites certainly will still be using diesel fuel. Um, and even if they're electric, you don't want to be wasting that resource either. So getting it right on site, educating the archeological team about decision-making processes and legal requirements, indicating on your site drawings where you might want to place stockpile materials and sticking to that uh, and explain to people why, because often on site that message gets lost and people then just start to make their own ad hoc decisions, which can lead to rework, which again, time, money, safety all then come in. So have that plan for placement and try and stick to it. Um, dig once and place once if you're doing sustainable placement, um, particularly for ecological works after archaeological activities. This helps to protect the integrity of the soil biome and reduces emissions as well. Obviously, digging anything up reduces huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. Thinking about whether or not you need to backfill and whether or not you need to export that material. And again, having those discussions, can it be stored on site? Can it stay on site? This will reduce plant and vehicle movements and also then mitigate impacts on the surrounding communities who aren't used to having huge numbers of construction vehicles trundling through their environment. And can you use risings to support other landscaping schema or approve local ecology? Um, Crossrail had some success with this uh, in the marshlands. Um, and these are things that obviously we now need to consider because we've got some good case studies and some good evidence that this sort of thing works. The other thing I'd encourage you to think about and to train your staff in where possible uh, or engage with your clients and other contractors are archaeological works and non-native invasive species. Um, Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam and things like giant hogweed are prevalent on a large number of construction sites, particularly the sort of industrial sites. Um, they're often first encountered, but not always identified by the archaeological teams, but they're hugely challenging to manage and dispose of. And they often involve grubbing out huge amounts of soil materials. If people understand what these plants look like, understand how to manage and put in exclusion zones on site, it means that we can reduce the cross contamination um, through archaeological works and other works and mitigate the amount of material that has to go to specialist uh, landfill sites that reduces the carbon, it reduces the amount of grubbing out, so the bulk excavation to, to manage this risk, because we are not legally allowed to knowingly spread or transfer these non-native invasive species. Um, it's 
you know, we have to follow UK law and environmental requirements. Um, we had success with this on HS2 previously, and we combined integration of archaeological processes and ecological mitigation for contaminated land with knotweed at St. James's Gardens. We saved over a million pounds um, and over 120 tonnes of embodied carbon by getting the ecological construction and archaeological teams to work together educating everybody about how we were actually going to achieve the goals of the archaeological team, the ecological team, and making sure we manage the contamination as well. So it's a really successful, positive piece of work. And it came about through communication and making sure that everybody had the right knowledge about what each discipline needed to do in order to achieve their legally mandated goals. And obviously touching on reuse of heritage assets. Um, encouraging your tier one contractors, your tier two contractors, your clients to retain and reuse heritage assets as part of site one materials, um, surfacing, structural materials, decorative elements all help add to that landscaping, placemaking and wayfinding piece. And I know that many of the archaeological contractors that Costain deal with have a great track history of doing this, um, but maybe it's not always thought about at the front end of the project or necessarily the benefits articulated in a way that make people appreciate just how valuable this element of your work and your knowledge can be. Um, it adds a sense of place, it adds a sense of permanence, you're using all of this material that has these embodied carbon elements in it um, and it's basically harking back to what was on site and helping to educate the wider public and retain that sense of understanding their landscape and the different uh, transition processes and historic uses of their neighbourhoods. So really important for a community, social value, carbon, cost um, and educational perspective as well. I've put together a small set of links, it's a bit of a resource toolkit. Um, many of you may already know about these, but if you don't, then they're here as a reference point. Um, all of these uh, different groups, companies, um, organisations look at carbon in different ways and help to manage, understand and challenge processes in different ways. Um, things like environmental product declarations really useful. We use that in construction a lot because it tells us exactly what the carbon uh, quantity is embedded in the product that we are procuring. Um, national highways now have their own carbon tool. A lot of us work for national highways and sit on the framework. Um, so also really important. And then there are great recycling companies like TerraCycle who can help you to meaningfully recycle and manage and reduce waste um, whilst giving back to specific charities as well. And they do that all for free. There's no cost to you. So again, it's a really good thing to get involved with. I know my slides have been quite wordy, but I did them like that specifically because I felt that people might want to um, to take them away and read them. So I've tried to cram in as much information as possible. Sorry, it's not very aesthetically pleasing. And then last of all, I guess the takeaway, um, the early engagement piece is key. You all know that sometimes it's a battle um, and we all need to work together to make it less of a battle. Um, but archeologists are often best placed to flag what materials are like to be buried on site based on their desk-based assessments and the research that's done in advance of any boots on the ground. Um, from an archaeological perspective, if you can get to know the legislation and how it might apply to archaeological activities around waste management, then that is very helpful. Work with the contractors to identify areas for material storage early on um, or develop your own approach if you're working outside CDM regs, you're not reporting directly to anybody or going straight for a, a site handover. Um, supporting and training the people who watch machines, so the archaeologists who do the machine watching. Um, Chaotic grubbing out and removal of foundations to reach earlier stratigraphy uh, reduces the benefit of site one materials if the materials are not correctly managed and segregate, which brings me to my next point, which is if you can separate and segregate where possible as early as possible, it creates a cleaner product that's easier to reuse and it means that you're not wasting time, uh, carbon and money trying to turn them into something that is still useful. Um, and just harking back to point three, sometimes all you really need to do is change a behavior and not invest in a product or a tool. So by educating each other about our needs, requirements and how we can all find benefits and changing people's behaviors, for example, the behavior of those watching the machines um, and driving the machines, obviously, um, then actually you can see great savings and it's a very quick and effective way of making that change. And obviously liaising with local salvage yards uh, and heritage conservation contractors within the locality of your projects to identify routes for distributing unique or reusable site one assets is also really important as well. Um, and I think that is it. Okay, thank you very much, Caroline. I mean, I think there's some fantastic practical um, lessons in there and things that we can 
actually do to really positively impact on on our sort of like the way in which we we manage our climate um change policies within within our organizations and across the industry there so i think you know there's definitely some further engagement and looking at the chat again i think people are picking up on that so we'll draw that out maybe in the, well we will draw that out in the discussion at the end um so to just round off the presentations we're we're going to move over to hannah fluck from the national trust and she's going to um talk about the <coughs> Um, nature for climate peatland grant scheme and obviously peatlands are very critical in terms of um, carbon because they are one of the ways in which carbon is is stored so disturbing them actually releases carbon into the environment inadvertently so if I could pass over to Hannah so you can round off the presentations and then I think we'll have a pretty um, lively discussion looking at the chat And I don't know, are you muted at the moment? Because I can't hear you. Should be able to hear you now, Hannah, hopefully. Oh no, she's got a problem with her sound. Ah. Hannah, do you want to just log out and log back in again? And I think um, we'll just wait a second for you, see if that works. Okay, so, I mean, I've picked up quite, quite a few points for discussion, so I'm I think um, I'll just look at trying to sort of formulate those into into themed groups before we before the end of the next presentation. Unless Hannah really struggles, and we might have to have a few take Definitely a few questions now. Oh yeah, we can hear you now. Can you put your slide up? Hear me, but now I can't hear anyone else. <laughs> no, we can hear you though. We can okay. hear you, Hannah. If I try screen sharing. So, can someone wave at me if you can hear me? Excellent. Thank you. Right, let's try again. Sorry about that. My um, computer decided to block everything, which wasn't overly helpful. Okay, I'm not sure. Um, I've got your presentation here, Hannah, if you want me to share works. it. Okay. I know she's okay. done it. Thank you. You're to it. see, um, but I can't see you. So I'm going to assume you can see me and crack on. Apologies for that. Um, so I'm presenting today, I'm sort of moonlighting a little bit in relation to some work that I was involved with um, over the past couple of years, looking at developing a sort of heritage aware approach to, to peatland restoration in England. Um, I'm really standing in for, for the expert on all this, um, Kat Hotwood Lewis from Natural England, who has very kindly shared um, presentations that she's done from which I've drawn this. So any mistakes are mine um, and um, anyone who wants to follow up with questions about the peatland grant scheme um, should contact Kat and I have um, emails at the end there. Uh, as um as we just heard so peatlands are incredibly important for um as habitats but in particular when it comes to carbon um they are i think that the most important um habitat and resource that we have for sequestering carbon they're the most spatially efficient way of storing carbon they contain more, more than seven times more carbon than any other temperate ecosystem um 30 just 30 centimeters depth of peat stores the same amount of um, carbon as the same as a he per hectare as rainforest 
um, and peat stores over twice as much carbon as trees globally. But when they are degraded, peatlands are a significant emitter of carbon. So getting our peatlands from a degraded condition into a good condition is absolutely essential to solving um, the, the, the climate crisis and starting to, um, to make amends to the harm that we've been doing to the world. Unfortunately, within the UK, 80% of our peatland is in a degraded strait. Um, from a National Trust perspective, um, peatlands are a really important um, aspect of our, of our move towards becoming um, net zero for carbon by 2030. Um, but they're also a significant emitter of carbon for us. So we are aiming to establish restoration processes across all of our degraded peatland by 2040. And many other landowners are taking similar action, um, as encouraged by the um, incentives such as the Nature for Climate Peatland Grant Scheme, which is what I'm going to refer to today. So just a little bit of background. Um, the Peatland Historic Environment Policy in England um, went through a bit of a, a, a transformation a few years ago in which um, we have recognition that heritage is not only integral to um, the part of the uh, DEFRA 25 year environment plan, um, as you can see at the top there, but actually the recognition that our peatlands are an iconic feature of our landscape and contain records of our past um, is now embedded in that England England Peat Action Plan. Um, and, Hannah, and that's something Hannah. which is really shows a bit of a change from some of the um, the perceptions of heritage in previous approaches to peatland restoration. So historically, there's been a bit of an uneasy relationship, even adversarial, um, with heritage being seen as an obstacle sometimes to peatland restoration. And this is something that we absolutely need to move away from. Um, the, whereas in 2021, we've got a very clear recognition with a joint statement from Natural England and Historic England that actually doing nothing itself um, with regard to our peatlands is a threat to the pres preservation of our, of our historic environment features and it's in our interest to work together to help ensure that the restoration occurs and occurs in a way that is mindful of heritage. Um, we also know um, from the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment in 2021, which I was a contributing author for, that actually the threat from unintended consequences from climate mitigation and adaptation measures is, is a very real threat to heritage. Um, and again, this is another reason why we've worked hard to get heritage embedded within the Climate Peatland Grant Scheme. So the nature of the Climate Peatland Grant Scheme um, involves um, 55 million pounds over the next five years to restore 35,000 hectares of degraded peat. It's delivering these climate mitigation, but also these additional public benefits, um, contributing to flood mitigation, water quality, biodiversity, drought resilience, and also societal benefits um, through improving the preservation of cultural heritage and understanding of that, and improving landscapes and providing space for recreation and supporting engagement with the changing um, environment around us and the, the history of that, that environment. Um, there are two different sorts of grants, discovery and restoration grants. The discovery grants are designed to prepare understanding um, ahead of restoration grants. It's administered by Natural England and we have specialist peatland heritage advice um, through CAT, Hopper Lewis. And there is also a plan to build a pan UK um, sector wide confidence in peatland heritage which is something that um, is, is a, a topic of conversation at the moment, how best we might be able to do that. There's a number of pieces of guidance which can support not just the scheme, but also other works. Not all peatland restoration will occur through the um, climate peatland grant scheme. Um, and this includes a guidance, the pre-application advice, um, input into how um, the applications are scored, um, support on complex pace work, quality control on the grant aid and monitoring and CAT and colleagues are, are um, undertaking that work through Natural England and there's also these collaborative um, publications looking at peatlands in the historic environment and peatland restoration in the historic environment providing standards as to how that would occur. Um, so in terms of the specifics around making sure that the historic environment is considered within peatland restoration, it's worth recognising that most peatland restoration works will fall outside of 
Development and Management Controls, MPPF, does not apply. Um, and not all peatland restoration will occur through the um, Nature of the Climate Peatland Grant Scheme, but that is the biggest source of funding for peatland restoration in England. There are different schemes being developed for other UK nations. The historic environment assessments are a requirement of applications to um, that, that's the NCPGS, um, and they're designed to help applicants identify what they know, what the potential for unknown sites may be, and to inform the restoration methods that they might apply. The NCPGS manual restoration annex has useful information on techniques which might work better for archaeological features, um, but generally avoiding or minimising ground disturbance where possible is key, which I don't think will come as a surprise to anyone here. Um, the, the other important point is that, that in principle, peatland restoration is, is absolutely beneficial to heritage, and we, we, um, we need to make, make that pretty clear, actually. Um, because that isn't always understood, certainly by colleagues working within peatland restoration. Um, that, that history of, of heritage as being a bit of a barrier to undertaking restoration works um, still can still loom, um, loom large. Um, Archaeology as part of peatland restoration can help with engagement around the environmental change that places have seen over time and, and also illustrate the need for changing practice either by um, contextualizing how that change has occurred, showing what harm has occurred to organic materials within those peat deposits as they may have dried out or the hydrology has changed, um, as, as well as illustrating that, that idea of environmental change in places over time, challenging that idea that, thing, that particular or current practices have always been the case. Um, we know that archaeology um, archaeological interest is, is on the peat, within the peat and below the peat, so the impacts um, from the works need to take that into account, clearly. Um, and also, we also um, have to point out that, that, as many of you will be aware, um, some types of archaeological site which would be typically found within peatlands are not currently designatable, even though they may be of equivalent significance. Um, which um, and there's also an, an under recognition or under recording often of the archaeological sites within these deposits. So avoiding harm to sensitive areas by avoiding direct impact is possible. However, there are occasions where excluding um, archaeological deposits from schemes might actually mean that they can't benefit from the improved hydrology and, and depositional environment um, which would occur were they well embedded within those schemes and so sometimes um, it's better to look at the controlled or mitigated direct impact upon those archaeological deposits rather than trying to exclude them altogether um, and for large sites then they be um, where, where the peat hydrology has been affected works are, are, are likely to be needed but there are methods that can be chosen and, and the guidance um, that's available does indicate that um, the progress so far, the scheme is, is underway, and Kat kindly shared these, um, these statistics. Um, so there are a lot of schemes, um, a lot of money, and a lot of carbon being um, um, captured as a result of this. Historic environment assessments are being undertaken, uh, with over 500 archaeological sites and fine spots being um, benefiting or recognised within the boundaries of these restoration areas, although that's just from year one. Um, and um, currently on track to deliver the, the um, targets within the five-year program. So the key messages, I think, um, are peatland restoration is absolutely essential for climate, nature and heritage. Um, it's more important than almost any other action that we can take for climate mitigation um, and sequestration. Good peatland restoration seeks to avoid, minimise and mitigate harm to the historic environment is possible. Um, but archaeology can also help communicate the story of that environmental change and that need for action. In some area, the cha visible changes to the landscape that occur with peatland restoration can seem quite brutal. And I know from talking to colleagues at National Trust that support in helping engage and tell those stories of environmental change um, is, is very welcome. We need more archaeologists who are confident in advising on peatland restoration schemes. Um, we are looking um, at how Pan UK and cross-sector collaboration might help with that to promote greater understanding of heritage in peatland. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that this is this is cutting edge. The, what the, the England scheme and the way in which it's explicitly included heritage is world leading. Um, but being world leading um, 
means that there's often a steep learning curve. So um, this is this is a, a sort of work in progress to look at how we can better embed archaeology within this. And Natural England plans to review this scheme, um, spread good practice and establish a Peatland Historic Environment Practitioner Network for England. So here's a, some contacts for some further information, um, which I will leave up for a moment. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Hannah. What you couldn't see, but we were desperately trying to catch up, was that your slides weren't progressing. <laughs> you can't hear me, can you? <laughs> I'm sorry, it was difficult to see where the slides were <laughs> keep up, so I was yeah, running through them, but as we said in the chat, it. we can yeah. share them afterwards. Yeah, so I don't think Hannah can hear me. Well, if you can talk, she can't hear me, and so she can't tell me. Okay, well, no, that was that was interesting. Hopefully people managed to um, keep up with that. And I think um, if... Um, Anna Morales unmuted anywhere. If we could perhaps um, kick off with a, a bit of a discussion session around that. I've picked out a few themes. I don't know about you, Hannah. Yeah, um, I've also uh, picked out some of the questions that came in the chat. Maybe everyone could, um, if they'd like, uh, put their videos on if they're comfortable with that so we can have a um, open group discussion as well. So just um, first one of the things, shall I go through some of the questions um, and some of the comments just really briefly so that we can highlight it, but any, anyone's uh, points that I um, uh, I sort of mis misinterpret, please do come just open your mic and just uh, comment. So there was a lot of talk threaded through the chat and actually through the presentations about collaboration and working in partnership. Um, so Richard Hughes, for example, mentioned uh, to check out engineers and, um, and partnerships and how we could work together. And of course, that was something that Sue Higgins also raised in terms of um, just with Scottish heritage. And then just a couple of questions on things like um, uh, what of the use of trialing a low carbon con concrete for circular economies and just having questions on alternative approaches. Uh, so those are some of the main questions of just how to integrate plans for reuse and recycle and circular economies. So those are the main themes, but um, I leave it to you, Andy, if you've picked up any other points. Um, yeah, I think there was just some things that I'd picked up on. Sorry, I've had to move to a phone because there's people in the office talking behind me. Um, one thing I was I was thinking was there's, there's certainly some areas where we can push some of those ideas into uh into see for guidance I think and some of our processes more directly so I was interested to explore that as an option and also I think that I mean amongst some of the speakers there's some fantastic experience and knowledge there that could possibly be captured into the group e either on an ad hoc basis or as a you know a just increase the number of people inputting because there's some very I thought there was some very insightful experience there that that maybe covers things that we haven't addressed or maybe has better ways of addressing that um I have a I have a question I suppose um one of the things that I realized threaded through a lot of the work that I do in relation to sustainability is um, is about capacity building and uh, training teams and so on. And I noticed that uh, in a couple of the presentations, there was the point of, you know, carbon literacy pro uh, project um, and sort of building capacity and training within the team and allowing them to identify ways in which they could immediately um, contribute to carbon mitigation. And I was just wondering if any of the speakers had something a little bit more to say on that, for example, how uh, that team training benefited um, benefited the work that they they undertook or they experienced. So, for example, Emily mentioned it, and so did Caroline. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I think from from my perspective, the the training was 
really interesting um, and sort of opened my eyes, I think, um, because it then gave me a foundation of knowledge to move on from. Um, as a team, it re resulted in us, um, you know, setting and agreeing um, sort of, a, you know, some internal targets for ourselves, which we're now working towards as part of the work that I highlighted um, on the presentation. Um, I think, yeah, honestly, I, I just thought it was really, really informative, really helpful and sort of really galvanizing in uh, in informing myself. And I think that's a lot of it. You know, we talked a lot about education and spreading knowledge and, you know, making sure that people are informed about this, because if people are informed, then they know how to take actions. I think there's a lot of problems with I, I refer to it as buffering because it seems so big. Um, but I think once you're trained and you understand it more, um, it, it gets a bit smaller. It gets a bit smaller and a bit more manageable. And I think that's one of the ways in which the, the literacy training really helps. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate that, you know, I'm happy to be contacted by people if they're interested in picking up those resources that HS2 can offer to them. Um, or just, yeah, talking more generally about the Garden Literacy Project and what it was like. Yeah, I had a point off that. Um, Emily, which was at the moment, obviously you presented it and it's, it sounds like a fantastic resource, but it was sort of keyed up as being available for HS2 supply chain. I wondered whether as part of HS2 legacy, they'd be prepared to widen access to it beyond the supply chain, maybe to the whole sector. Oh, I'd have to take that away and speak no, to I realise you'd have to take that away. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, but I could certainly speak to Mark Fenton, who's our carbon manager, our carbon lead for the whole project. Yeah. Um, and Ticks a legacy what, box, though, as well, you can point out. So, yes, we do love a legacy. Um, so <laughs> we do love a legacy item. Um, yeah, we'd love to, I guess, get, have it on that, uh, you know, similar website to Crossrail has, where they've got all their legacy training items um, up on that nice shiny website for everyone to use. So I'll take that away, Andy. Yeah, you mentioned sustainable data in your cycle of things. I just wondered what, what does sustainable data look like as opposed to normal data? Ah, OK, I'm probably not the best person to look to speak about this, um, like Katie or even Dan Miles, actually. I don't know. I see Dan had his hand up. I wonder if Dan would like to jump in about sustainable data. Yeah. Um, no, not really. Um, <laughs> so we will aim for it, but we're not sure what it is at the moment. That was. Just... Uh, I think that's it'd be worth something from the ADS and people to think about in terms of that. But I know that people are looking at service size and all the little big digital carbon issues, aren't there? Uh, it would be interesting to see, to, to talk to the ADS in terms of what they're doing about that. And that would be something that could, they could probably uh, contribute to the, to these discussions. I was just, I had my hand up, I was just going to um, pick up on the last point about the carbon literacy training. Is it, I'm actually halfway through it at the moment, uh, and we're doing it as a sort of little bit of a trial. Uh, and there's potentially, we might be rolling that out to all HE staff. But it's it's very much a introduction and a sort of a, a more like thinking about it as a sort of personal sort of focus that we were looking at and our own lives and what we think about it as a sort of a much broader awareness and that sort of understanding of where it all fits in in terms of possibly you know staff becoming better informed and therefore be able to sort of take it out from the work into their own lives Whereas it's not specifically about supporting, say, some of the, um, the issues that we're discussing here or some of the pres presentations. And I think yeah. that that would need more, a different level of, of training or advice or support that, you know, we've already started sort of thinking about it. And But that, that you know, how to maybe, you know, going into more about, say, operational scopes. And, you know what does it mean and how do you think look at scope three your procurement and how do you do this and, and all these sort of things and that that could be it quite generalized because it is generalized across all organizations this is not just heritage organizations but then with specific relevance to our sector and i think that would be really interesting tailoring it to certain things so it might be like a core and then broadening it out or going down for say project managements or, or even for people who are involved in procurement uh, in their own organizations 
Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, I don't know if people understand the three scopes. I wasn't necessarily going to teach everyone it either, but um, I just did think it did wonder whether that actually feeds in a little bit into the scope two emissions. The so scope two emissions are how your staff impact on your business. So in that respect, that's where I saw that coming from. Certainly, there's three scopes that we're meant to measure against. Um, certainly we're looking at scope one and two ourselves, but obviously scope three has has a lot more of the on-site emissions in it. So really, if you're a contracting type organization, scope three is quite a big, big area to get to grips with. So just for just to summarize for those that don't know, scope one is really what you just generate internally as being a business. Scope two is more sort of um direct, indirect um impacts of your staff and things like that and then scope three is more the hired in plant and stuff um so sorry hannah to did you did you want to chase one of your other avenues of questioning or no i i think i'll i um i think leave it to the floor does anyone have any uh anything to bring up or comment about i can't see any hands you see was uh it would be really interesting you you were quite um active on chat in relation to just bridging engineers with uh archaeologists it would be interesting to hear more about your thoughts and including some icmos content. i had one for demetrios whilst we're waiting for people to work out what their questions were because you mentioned the nature recovery on hs2 the corridor um and going back to what i said at the beginning I just wondered if, I mean, you said it was like 10% positive, but I mean, that's 10% nature recovery in terms of area, I'm assuming, or more more nature than was there before we started. But I wondered if we knew what the actual carbon removal impact of that was looking at the, because to get to net zero, we've got to be looking at carbon removal in our actions. Did I didn't, wondered if Demetrios knew anything in relation to that, I think Demetrius has had to drop off the call. Oh, Andy, poor so. Andrew. <laughs> That's um, I think they both have. I'm terribly sorry. They are. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Well, that was my thought. <laughs> They're not there to answer it. Um, if you could um, jot it down for me, Andy, um, and I will ask Demetrius to get back to you if that's okay. Okay. Or you could jot it down and tell, ask him. I've got, <laughs> yeah. I, I honestly. I kind of missed it and I, okay, I don't all right, really all right. I'll send it to you. Really understand the question, so I'm going to be honest. So, okay, I won't ask them any more questions then. Probably um, better to say it in your words rather than me asking it. Dan, Phillips, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, we've heard quite a bit today from the private sector, the construction sector, and everything they're doing, which is great. Does anyone have any experience here of what the advisory sector is is contributing towards this from an Algae perspective, possibly? Um, certainly in Hearts, we have been looking at how we can instigate things within WSIs, within, within conditions, within requirements. I wonder if anyone has any thoughts on this or experience. Right. I haven't seen, I personally haven't seen anything filtering through yet, but I think you're right. It's a good, I think some of the activities, certainly some of the stuff that Caroline raised in terms of consideration of materials, I think that's important. I think some of my thoughts, Caroline, went to just good soil management and not 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 creating waste inadvertently. I mean, I and I would like to say it was colloquial, but actually it was a real conversation I had with a company that did soil moving they said for archaeology we don't bother keeping this topsoil and subsoil separate and you thought why why are you just making such a contaminated resource that the, it only has one destination once you've done that and the cost of that both in financial and environmental terms is quite substantial which just struck me as i mean and that that was a comment made in relation of, to delivering work for our sector not just generally that, mm -hmm. that was you know archaeologists don't need it keeping separately but we do for other reasons <laughs> yeah i think my experience of working with the archaeological contractors and also having previously worked in the archaeological contracting sector albeit quite a long time ago now you know archaeologists have have two 
great strengths in terms of their role. One, that they're the first people to, to cite. So as people say, you can often set the tone, set the requirements, um, and also ask challenging questions as well. The archaeological cohort as a whole are broadly, I think, more environmentally and sustainably aware and driven in their own personal lives, their home lives, educating their children and their families. It's something that as people who work very closely with the earth and have a very strong understanding of changes in the environment in the past, it comes into the fore in your daily working lives and also the standards you set yourselves as individuals. We saw that time and time again on Costain sites, people challenging, where's the recycling? Where's this waste going? What's happening over here? Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we involve X charities? Um, you know, and that's that's a great strength coming from the archaeological sector, whether people recognise it or not. You are, as a group, I think we are already mentally there um, and have the power to potentially educate. In terms of the materials management piece, being on site and able to shape um, what happens to those materials early on, being able to um, articulate those values. Um, around carbon, around sustainability, around social value, because social value is now being brought into the conversation a great deal more than it was before, are also hugely powerful. But again, it often falls on deaf ears because it comes to the wrong language being used about the benefits. Um, so talking about social value is good, but also then bringing in the carbon, bringing in the sustainability, bringing in the efficiency, bringing in the cost. Uh, and, Tier one contractors are always accused of being more cost conscious than anything else. And yes, cost is a consideration, but our primacy is safety, quality and environment and then cost. So when we're judging people's tenders, you know, cost isn't the first thing we look at, regardless of what people may think. Um, and yeah, the archaeological teams, I think, have, have a great opportunity to shape some of those processes by putting them into their written schemes of investigation and saying this is how we're going to deliver this work for you. Um, you know, recognize that we are managing carbon for you and this is how we're going to do it. I don't want to put the onus on the archaeological contractors, but it's something that can fall within your sphere of influence because you're there first and you're so great at the, the initial piece. So. And I think Richard, that's great, Caroline. I think Richard Hughes raised an interesting point in the chat, but I wondered whether we could poke at it a little bit more because one of the key things in terms of the environment is not to actually do do something in the first place not to create the footprint so unnecessarily digging archaeological sites and i think that was i think it was richard that raised that richard i don't know if you wanted to expand on that if it was you <laughs> Not, not, not really. Um, um, I think in situ preservation goes back, um, I suppose, in our documents to uh, PP, uh, to uh, to um, the 18, 1980s with PP nineteen and some PPG nineteen. Um, it, it seems that um, it's a good opportunity to preserve archaeological sites. Don't dig them. Build over the top of them. I'm. We've got many examples of that being successful in both the urban and rural environments. It means our assets are preserved and we're not spending energy on digging them. So we only dig those which are absolutely essential. Yeah, and I think that's something that we tend to not be good at. Um, can I can I just actually come in? Um, I see Emily's uh, hand is raised, but I just want to come back to something that Caroline said, which I found really um, relevant, is that uh, I think a lot of archaeological contractors really struggle with the costs of um, of moving towards net zero, and just uh, and I thought you're you're essentially saying that costs is last on the agenda and raising the point of the value of environmental um, and and uh, social well being. I guess you could say, which I just think is a really interesting point and tension that we tend to have. So when a lot of companies move. Um, make the move or start to think about going towards net zero, it is that low hanging fruit in the first instance that is at no cost almost or very low cost. And the idea is to then influence and feel um, and influence, let's say boards, members of the trustees, or even persuading um, one's own organization at, uh, at how there are cost benefits. So I think it, it it's a really good point to bring out that 
um, cost at the end of the day should be one of the uh, lowest um, prioritizations. Uh, Emily, you, you've had your hand raised for a while. That's okay. Um, I was uh, sort of responding to Dan, Dan's point. He asked about um, LPAs. Um, and I was going to say about, um, obviously, um, in Cambridgeshire, um, Quentin and the gang have been doing a lot of work on sustainability in terms of placemaking and sort of that kind of, you know, um, social value placemaking and making sure we're building sustainable places and all of those sort of things. Um, but I think I had an interesting conversation recently, which I hope the people involved in that conversation won't mind me sort of paraphrasing here, which reminded me that the thing the challenge with that the LPAs are of course facing is um you know resource the resource cuts um which are across the board um and a lot of them are going to be finding that more and more of a challenge and um potentially what we're going to find the LPAs maybe are needing to do is to hang their hats um on other benefits um which are getting the funding um, so, you know, if we can reduce emissions, that's a health benefit. If we can make better places, that's a that's a that's a health benefit. You know, it's a well-being. Um, so I wonder if, you know, that might be something that in terms of the LPAs they're looking at moving forward. And maybe we need to be cognizant of in our works about those 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 pressures and those crunches that they're they're feeling. Um, but again, again, you know, I think as you just touched on there, it sort of comes down to cash again. <laughs> I just put a note in the chat uh, for Hannah as well, but basically sustainability and construction in most um, environments is about changing behaviours and making people plan better rather than investing in huge technologically complex or expensive innovations. If you can reduce idling, make sure your site is set up in a way that is ergonomic and lean uh, and reduce damage to assets that you might have to use and also reuse materials rather than just breaking them down, crushing them down, and then disposing of them. It, it's all really about behavior and planning and not about huge technological outlay. And again, archaeological units who have traditionally relied on lower levels of funding um, and had lower profit margins are absolutely amazing at being innovative around behaviors um, and thinking about in smart ways about doing things better with less. And that is what sustainability is about. Unfortunately, yours have been economic drivers historically, but that's a great skill and knowledge to have. Sorry, Hannah, you were about to say something then, I think. Maybe. Yeah, but thanks. Thanks, Caroline. I was actually um, uh, in the chat, uh, Dan Phillips, you mentioned why not make um, environmental sustainability a requirement within any uh, WSI um, uh, as you're part of parts. <laughs> County Council, I wonder where uh, where something like that um, would go within your own um, council. Is that something that you could do, for example? Um, I certainly think within the new Leeds team, um, environment is being put front and centre of, of Hart's uh, sustainability and planning. Um, and we are being encouraged um, to explore every avenue uh, to look at how we build uh, climate change, environmental sustainability into archaeological practice, as well as the eco ecological department, landscape, etc., uh, which we're working together with. Um, and so, and I know that there is there is funding, and there is there is uh, a positivity towards any department within the council that is pushing that agenda. Um, and so, so yeah, that's certainly something that we, we have talked about and we could explore. Um, I don't particularly like the idea of doing something through compliance, but maybe that's something that we could insist upon. Hannah, Fluck. Might actually have managed to get it to both let me listen to you and speak to you. So, <laughs> sorry about earlier. National Trust systems really don't enjoy Zoom. Um, I just wanted to pick up on um, something that was said about um, 
that involvement between relationship between the historic environment and and that place making and sustainable places um i think that's something that absolutely we need to be more proactive in um most of the impacts on heritage are from changes in our land management and environmental practices um the vast majority of our archaeology is within areas that are under agricultural regimes currently um, and those are changing significantly we're also as we're looking at these development projects as i'm sure hs2 are aware um that uh, that bio that biodiversity gain is delivered through places that are sit outside of the the impact of the immediate construction areas um, and often for really large scale projects those can be in quite different parts of the country as well um, we're looking very carefully at the National Trust about how the historic environment can start to positively offer up places and opportunities for creating some of that biodiversity and climate gain. Um, but that does require a slightly different way of thinking than that sort of mitigating impact approach that we're probably most used to as archaeologists working in, so in, in commercial and even in local government sectors. I know someone mentioned the work in Cambridgeshire. I know Quentin has been looking at how that how that relationship can play out within their landscape planning um, but that's something else to sort of bear in mind that those skills of, of how you can make that translation and, and promote those benefits is something that we're we really um, struggle sometimes to find within the sector so i would i would make a plea to people who were who are interested or feel they might have something to offer that to really explore how they might be able to present that as part of the package of archaeological expertise for projects because there, there is and will be an increasing market for that. Yeah, really good point, um, Hannah. And also, I just wanted to raise something that Sadie was saying uh, in relation to social sustainability on the chat in that um, it's now a minimum of 10% on public sector tenders now. Sadie, do you have a little bit? more that you want to say on your work in relation of social value and its link to? Um, thanks, Han. It was just because the conversation was going in the in the direction of tendering and things like that now, and it is becoming more of an expectation that we will be able to respond to particular questions on tender documents, as, as people on this call probably know. And I think 10% um, is current minimum, but some have obviously infrastructure projects have a higher percentage. So it's important that we know how to, to usefully um, respond to those questions when they come. Yeah. Dan Miles, is that something that your project will pick up on? Understanding, uh, is or is it just scoping in relation to... Um... I think it's going to be more generic scoping at this level, but then again, I think that's where we we do that sort of deeper dive into that. My my own, my comment in that is I, I understand that and I know from um, Sally's work and, and everything and it my, my only concern was is that if we're some earlier comments thinking about you know some of the large organizations and I know HS2 have been doing a lot of support and that sort of level but some of the other large organizations that do have the resources in they have staff dedicated to this sort of work who are thinking about it is there the opportunity to be able to support smaller organizations within the sector as that sort of peer-to-peer -peer and things and and I, I absolutely i'm sure that it will happen but there's always that little tiny element of the competitive tendering and is this seen as a contract winner do you know what i mean i don't think it is and i think i'm being a bit black and white on it i'm being a bit daft but it, it just it's always just those alarm bells of things going on so, and I think it's maybe something that we do need to think about. And I think the majority of people in the sector will be going, no, no, we, this, is, this is bigger, much bigger. The climate crisis is huge. So we need to really think collectively and work together, but it's just something to, to be aware of. And I think that was part of the purpose of the working group really was to try and channel experiences from one organization to another and to openly share those. I mean, it's difficult to get organisations that aren't working together to join up in some respects because there's a lack of, there's some sort of lack of visibility in that respect, not so much a competitive one, just um, it's beyond the focus of individual organisations normally because they're focused on delivering their own work in a 
not in any sort of malicious way. Um, I, I did have go on. Uh, just really quickly, if there's um, where where this all sits with fame, of course, from a um, uh, from a managerial perspective, if anyone from fame is around who might have something on that, I do know that they have an. I did inquire actually um, a couple of weeks ago and asked where they sit with uh, climate change and um, climate action, and was they do have an environmental group, and uh, climate change is one of the themes, but not necessarily. Um, an overall focus is what I understood from the response. Sadie? I just wanted to quickly respond to what Dan said, which is absolutely right. We do need to, the scalability of this is a really big challenge and the competitive, we don't want to necessarily compete over our net zero plans, of course, but Caroline said it, I think, earlier when she said that we're already really in the ballpark. We're already thinking about it. We already do lots of stuff. And it's the same as social rally. We already do loads of things that we don't evidence properly or usefully. So in a way, I think there's a there's a kind of exemplar of, of evidence production, or I don't know what you'd call it even, but but that sort of thing would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, Can I just say my experience of archaeological teams in the construction environment is that archaeologists are absolutely excellent at measuring what they find and what that means. They're not very good at measuring their own activities. And that's what will need to change. Um, so thinking about those measurements, the outputs of your people, productivity, time scales, distance traveled, um, and the regional kind of demographic, um, all sorts of things. But yeah, archaeological teams brilliant at measuring what you find and what that actually tells you in a quantifiable, meaningful way, how you do it, measuring how you do it and the people involved. Very hard to get anybody to have any kind of tangible discussion about that. Dan, Miles. Uh, just picking up your point, Hannah, about the, the FAME group. I think this is this is where we do need to have those contacts between the, the CIFA group, the, you know, Dan and, and everyone who's organised today's session and that FAME group, because surely they're looking at similar type of things and they're all in the same organisations probably. So I think it's that networking and that joining up and that maybe that's something that Alex, you know, from that CIFA hierarchy needs to have conversations with Kenny or, or whoever it is about but I think that would be really useful and then also actually bringing in that the, the Algeo side of things as well because I think that's really an interesting way of exploring because like Dan was saying and, and Ben was saying is that they've got their own each local authority has their own net zero plans and stuff and it would be interesting to see how it's coming from that way where the other things are coming out I'm expressing with my hands and on zoom and it never works but um yeah it's just connecting things up and we should really try and do that before it's too late and we all start going off in different directions it sometimes happens yeah absolutely emily um i was just gonna say i can't speak for the fame group but i have sat in on their meetings um which they've kindly allowed me to do um so yeah they are looking i, I can say that they are looking sort of broadly at the similar things to everybody else really and i totally agree with them it's all about just connecting up the dots and that's what um, a lot of what I, my, you know, what I found in my work is it's really essential that we start connecting up all these dots because everyone's doing loads of really great things, but not everybody's talking about it. Or as Caroline says, archaeologists are rubbish at recognising when they're doing something really brilliant and being like, we're doing something that's brilliant. It's, you know, they don't think it's groundbreaking, but, and, you know, as Sadie said, you know, it, it really is. Um, so I think that's something, a skill we need to develop in ourselves is to stop thinking that we're, uh, not doing a good job and that we're not doing something amazing because generally we are um, more than we think absolutely i just i want to follow up on that when in um and i i suppose that's where capacity building and training also comes into place of when you start to be aware of uh the services and and activities that you do are actually very strong uh um well let's you know, strong um, activities that work towards climate action or sustainability and, and things like that. So actually reflecting and reviewing on the on the skills that we have as a sector to then um, unpick and then and act and, and promote and share and with others. Uh, Phillips, Dan Phillips. You're muted. I hope that everyone would agree that whilst we've been talking about challenges here, there's Equally, there's going to be there's amazing opportunities to come out of this climate uh, crisis agenda, whatever. 
for archaeologists you know there are there is going to there is a growth there has been a growth there will be a growth in renewables there's going to be more different types of sites that come online for us to look at and investigate um church of england have pledged to make all of their building stock carbon neutral by 2030 which is what eight years away i have no idea how that's going to be achieved but on this on their stuff they're talking about ground source heat pumps and and, and solar panels so there's going to be opportunities for different types of archaeology to be undertaken over the next 10 15 years so as, as much as there are threats there's also some really po some positive things about this as well for us yeah it's definitely good to sort of hook onto the opportunities as well ben yeah hi um i was just going to say i think there's a lot of benefit to work with our natural environment colleagues a bit closer um, so we're very lucky we're in the same team here in, in Warwickshire. And I know Quinton is in, in, in Cambridgeshire as well. Um, and there's so many things that we're doing that we can we can do together. And there's a lot more influence with the natural environment sector. You know, we, we've got councillors, senior officers talking directly to to, you know, my boss in ecology about net zero, about carbon, about climate emergency. And we're right in there as a team as well helping to get that influence and, and and listening and i think now is the time we need to have more action that way we, we 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 need to meet with these people more talk to them more work together we're developing the same things you know and and there are lots of similarities across what we do um so yeah i i think that's one route we need to go go down yeah that was actually something that um, I was having a conversation with Dan Phillips about because he mentioned LEEDS at Hearts, and that actually stands for uh, Landscape, Ecology, Archaeology, Design and Sustainability. And one of the things that I really liked about what um, your council are, are doing, uh, Dan Phillips, is that um, uh, you, you also have away days and where you go out into landscapes and the different groups, ecologists, archaeologists and so on, explain how they experience and approach these different places as well, which was such a, if I understood, such a massive knowledge exchange and learning um, experience for your entire team. So you're also trying to connect the dots a little bit more, aren't you? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, we have these once a month, we go out with the local plan authority, with the ecologists, with the landscape officers, with the planners, we pick a site and we, you know we discuss all aspects of it so that we're seeing it from a, a cross sector really and um we're learning a lot from our colleagues um on areas we weren't we were unfamiliar with and, and i'm hoping that's reflected in, in reverse yeah. interestingly here in warwickshire as well what we've done is we've moved from a, a, a model of our team structure rather than being by profession it's actually by uh, function so instead of having the archaeologists in a team, the ecologists in a team, the landscape architects and professionals in a team, we've moved to a planning team, a projects team and a records team. So I'm actually in charge of both the historic environment record and the biological record center. So I'm getting perspective from both, both sides and I can see all the different things going on and how they're managing the data differently and working differently. And it's same for the team leader in, in planning. They're looking at how the archaeologists are doing things, the ecologists, the landscapes, giving advice to the same district and borough councils in in different ways and we and, and we need to we still need to make it better and integrate more you know um so it is really interesting i appreciate not, not everybody can do that but it's just an example of where i think we could work much better together more efficiently and 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 learn more together definitely i think that's really um a, a really interesting approach to basically breaking the silos instead of uh working across professions and those di different uh specialist approaches it's a um it's a cross function or i guess a task um so yeah that's really uh i see that we only have two more minutes left does does anyone want have any other comments i know there's lots of messages going through the chat i can't keep up with all of them um andy um okay so i was in terms of yeah i can see the messages i don't think i'm gonna be able to read and talk um I think a couple of takeaways, if you like, or even action points from today, and given you don't want to sort of waste the the value of the input that's in the room, really. Um, certainly, there's been a massive amount of advice and guidance flashed up on the screen in front of us that I think, as a group, we need to capture and digest and then re 
um, sort of resubmit in a in a in a more coherent fashion, so that people can can use some of the resources. I know Emily has a has a takeaway herself at the moment to go and see if we can access the some of the HS two resources across the industry. Um, there was the second thing was and collaboration has been quite quite prevalent throughout the discussions and so looking at areas we can collaborate in I know there was a comment about looking at what the geotechnical sector are doing I also work in a company that has about half of the geotechnical sector in it <laughs> so I can find that out fairly straightforwardly um it, it's interesting that we have a perception that maybe some of these people are more advanced than us and in some cases that you'd be surprised to find they're not necessarily but I think that there is a lot in common that we have with that sector and it will be worth us working with them to solve some of the problems that we jointly face. I think there was, I had a point that came out of certainly maybe to a degree Caroline's talk, but was raised mainly in, in Demetrius and Andrea's talk. I think that there's an opportunity to actually capture a supply chain here, a uh, a, basically a carbon neutral supply chain because they've been trying these things out they're getting them from somewhere i think it would be helpful certainly talking from someone in a contracting unit to be able to 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 easily source and look up suppliers of of that equipment so whether that's something we can add to the guidance or basically even advertise to those sectors that are providing that to say we'll give you free ads for your um solar powered power units for our welfare etc i mean we do have issues in relation to that in terms of we don't as archaeologists because we are in first we lack infrastructure that comes with the later development we need to recognize that we are very a hut in a field rather than being able to connect water and electric to our field which then we have to go away from and gets used as a field again afterwards um and i think the other the other area that I'd picked up on was there's was to really capture some of the knowledge in the room as well. Certainly, I mean, after Emily, your talk and the, the work that you're doing, I'm I'd personally be interested to see more of it, to see if you could put input directly into the group. Again, Caroline, I think you've got some valuable um points to input, and I appreciate your time as a premium. <laughs> But, you know, not it might, not. I think that there's some valuable stuff because what we're sort of lacking at the moment in the group is that is that um, client down view, if you like, that might help steer some of what we do. And, and there's certainly I think that adds value to some of the work we do. So, I mean, if we as a group take those actions away, I'd like to feel that, you know, not only have we learned a bit but we'll also have achieved something from today's session more than happy to get involved andy more than happy okay, to that'd be great yeah so if you talk to alex you'll um <laughs> connect you with us um and so my thought you know going back to where we started it is it really the next step is going to be how can we remove carbon as a result of our activities to a degree some of the aspirations that have been set in terms of carbon zero 2035 you've got to look at what tech you know the technology that's there that will take carbon out of the atmosphere and use it on your activities is is really at an infancy at the moment and i suppose looking to see what's available or even finding finding what's available in those ways is going to be tricky but i mean the only way that we're going to achieve this is if there's some technology that eventually can do that because planting trees is not going to solve the whole of the <laughs> equation but i think you know we've taken some massively positive steps today and and, it, and it's some and it's a really really good turnout so i'm pleased with that alex i think that's that's really positive to see that so many people are interested in in what we're what we're trying to achieve
Yeah, I think it was really good. And I think one of the things that is just before we close and uh, thank all of our speakers as well um, uh, for coming, it's also that actually it doesn't feel that daunting and these sort of things are very positive because there is so much that's being done. There is so much knowledge and skills and resources that's already out there. And perhaps part of the issue that we have to address is the question of collaboration and partnership and just opening our doors a little bit more, which is what um, I really got out from the session in terms of just hearing the scale and the and the the wealth of information and and knowledge already out there and activity. So I think it's really really positive. I realize we're four minutes over, so I'm um, uh, I take the liberty to say thank you to everyone. If there's um, any uh, further kind of questions or if um, if there is any in interesting points that you 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 want to raise or or um, send off to the climate change working group for their list that uh, Dan Phillips has shared, please please do because it's as he said it's a living document and this is just everyone is trying to work together to progress on um, towards climate change and uh, sustainability. So yeah, please do. the The takeaway message is just to stay in touch and share share knowledge exchange and. Um, and uh and collaborate so um yeah thank you i don't know alex if you want to have close your session as well um yeah thank you very much it's been, it's been really interesting and it's been um trying to keep up with the chat has been really difficult so i'll see if i can summarize what's in there so that we can keep a list of those useful resources and um a huge thank you to andy hannah and all the other speakers that have come along today it's it's been great to see such a good turnout so I'll stop the recording now. Thank you. Okay, thanks.